who was wanted by them for the theft of millions and millions of dollars and was actually on Interpol's most wanted list. They discovered that Albert Walker had been living in Ontario with his wife, Barb, and their family. The couple split up acrimoniously and he was arrested trying to break into the family home. A month later, in December 1990, Albert Walker, who ran an investment company, disappeared, along with $3.2 million of clients' money. Albert Walker absconded uh, from Canada with his uh, daughter, Sheena. Um, it was the understanding by the Walker family um, that uh, they were going on a vacation, a skiing vacation. Um, eventually, when they didn't return in a reasonable amount of time, um, especially with Barb Walker, it was, it was panic. Um, she uh, became uh, very, very worried about the safety of her daughter. A missing person's photograph of Sheena, who was 15 at the time, was circulated worldwide. Mr. Walker, uh, we knew, had traveled to England and then to Switzerland. Um, and at that point, the, the trail had gone cold, um, so we really had no idea where Mr. Walker was. That was because Albert Walker had assumed his first false identity. He became David Davis, a man who'd been an investor in his company. I think originally he used a false identity of David Davis, possibly just to get out of Canada um, and, and live as his first port of call in England. Once that identity had run its course, he needed someone else. And I don't think that he could believe his luck when he stumbled across Elaine Boyce and Ronald Platt. The police were starting to unravel Albert Walker's web of deceit. He'd met Ron and his girlfriend Elaine after moving to Harrogate in 1991. Within 18 months, he'd befriended them, made them directors of his bogus company, and paid for them to emigrate to Canada. Next, he moved 300 miles south to Devon, with his new identity and his new wife. When Judith DiMarte put an ad in the local paper for a cottage to rent, it was a Mr. and Mrs. Ron Platt who contacted her. He turned up with his very pregnant wife and um, loved the cottage, loved the location, said it was just what they were looking for. They moved into the middle of a row of cottages just across the yard from the farmhouse where Judith and her sister Carol lived. He did come over as a slightly exaggerated character and I put that down, I think, to perhaps keeping up with a young wife. The dyed hair and the uh, very expensive dental job, which I noticed almost immediately, um, and the rather youthful clothes for a man of his age gave me the impression that he was trying to, he was trying to keep up with a young wife. Ron was an amateur artist who displayed his work at home even when it gave a clue to his past life as David Davis. My daughter, who was studying art at the time, remarked about a painting uh, that he kept on an easel. He said that it was one of his paintings, and she remarked on the fact that it was signed David, and he said, oh, that was a name they used to call me when I was at college. Um, but we thought nothing of it at the time. The baby arrived in September 1993, and they continued to live at Kestrel Cottage, posing as husband and wife for another year. There was an occasion when we were in conversation and she called Ron Daddy. Um, it, 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 it left a mark. I, I, I noticed it, but didn't altogether think it odd. It, was, it seemed to me to be a term of affection, I suppose, really. I can't really speculate on what roles they played when we weren't there, but I have to say that they were very, very convincing. It never occurred to me at any time that they weren't husband and wife. Never did that enter my mind. And I think I went into shock when I found that, it, that in fact, they weren't. One evening he spoke to Carol about a new business idea he was considering. He was interested in marriage guidance counselling and he asked me if I knew um, of any centres of counselling where he could take classes and I recommended one or two. And over a period of months he attended. It would have been a, a very basic qualification. I have to say that I was quite surprised when he started uh, talking about setting up his own counselling centre. 
At the end of 1994, they moved again, this time east to Essex, where the police were eventually to catch up with him. Here, the fake Ronald Platt was exaggerating his qualifications to friends he made at the local tennis club. He did say he was a psychologist and he was working somewhere near Brentwood. But that really was as far as he wanted to go. And so I, I, I told him that there were a, a number of uh, medical people who were members of the club who played tennis, and I offered to uh, you know, introduce him, and he wasn't quite so keen on that. I found him quite friendly and quite likeable. His wife, on the other hand, she was extremely young, surprisingly young, probably less than half his age, and she was quite the opposite. She never spoke. Uh, in fact, uh, when, when I, I spoke to her or asked her a question, she always looked to him for permission to answer the question, and I found that was very, very strange. The family lived in Essex for two years, and another child was born there. But the man locals knew as Ron Platt was about to lose control of his carefully constructed identity. In 1995, he had news from Canada. The real Ronald Platt was returning home to live in Britain. He probably thought that by sending the genuine Ronald Platt to Canada, he could then have a life-long identity that he could use with no comebacks. But obviously, that didn't turn out to be the case. There was now two people living in a very small area by the name of Ronald Platt with the same date of birth and same documents. And this was obviously a threat to his continuing freedom. Canadian fugitive Albert Walker had plenty to hide, and a motive to murder Ronald Platt. I think on that day, Albert Walker took Ronald Platt out as a friend on his boat, maybe for a bit of fishing, purely with the intention of taking him out there and killing him and dumping his body overboard. I think Ron would have trusted him right till the end. I don't think he will have had any doubts or fears, otherwise I don't believe he would have gone on the boat. He wouldn't have gone on the boat if he didn't trust him, I'm sure. Albert Walker was still protesting his innocence at his trial in June 1998. But the woman who everyone thought was his wife, but was actually his daughter, was about to be a key witness. In June 1998, Albert Walker went on trial for the murder of Ronald Platt. On the way into Exeter Crown Court, he hid his face, but once inside, he appeared confident that the case against him wouldn't succeed. At no time did he really think that he was in difficulty. He didn't think that anyone could prove that he had murdered this man. No one witnessed the murder. No one was able to say, therefore, for certain where it took place or how it took place. The Rolex watch, which helped identify Ron's body in the first place, also provided a vital clue to the time of the murder. The watch was water resistant and self-winding, but at the bottom of the sea, and motionless, it would stop after around 48 hours. Because the watch had stopped at 22nd day, we were able to establish that in fact, um, it would have entered the water on around about the 20th or the 21st of July. There were more clues to be found in the computer memory of the boat's global positioning system. Remarkably, that was able to tell us that on the date in question that we were looking at, that Mr. Davis's boat had been out at sea in not a position far away from where Ronald Platt's body had been trawled up. Ron's ex-girlfriend, Elaine Boys, was called to give evidence against the man she'd known as David Davis. I thought, I'm not going to look at him. I'm not purposely not going to make any eye contact. But of course, once I was in there, I did glance. And when I looked at him, I thought how much he'd aged. And also, he was grey, but he still looked like the Mr Davis. He was very smart, very grand. It, it was still Mr Davis. Elaine's evidence was damning because she could explain the background to their friendship and why he had a motive for murder. Ron Platt 
represented a real threat to Albert Walker because Albert Walker had been using Ron Platt's name and details and if he had been exposed someone would have said who is this man who has been calling himself Ron Platt? The prosecution also called Sheena, Albert Walker's daughter, who'd been on the run with her father for six years, posing as his wife, and now the mother of two small children. I think as an individual, she'd come under the spell of her father um, and had been brainwashed um, into protecting him. And unfortunately, she was used as a bit of a... Uh, a psychic, a bit of an alibi for him um, in various aspects of their lives together, um, which is a sad thing. When her father was arrested, Sheena returned to Canada with the children. Two years later, she was back for the trial. She was able to state that she hadn't been aware that Mr. Platt was in the Devon area shortly before his death. At the time of the murder, Sheena, the children and Albert Walker were staying in a holiday cottage in Devon. We said that it was highly significant that the defendant had kept from his daughter that he was seeing Mr. Platt, when Mr. Platt was, of course, a friend of the family. And we said that that was entirely consistent with Mr. Walker having planned this murder, but wanting to make sure that his daughter knew absolutely nothing about it. And Sheena couldn't give her father an alibi for the day of the murder. One point of evidence that Sheena did give on the witness stand was that on the day in question, on the day we, we suspected that the murder was committed, she did confirm that her father had been out on the boat. It had been very bad weather, and he'd come back late and wet. That, of course, wasn't strong evidence in its own right, but we said that that was important because it...